Um, Patricia's expertise, well, is, is, is also unfairly enormous, really. Uh, but uh, I, I guess the sort of smallest uh, focus uh, in her work has been on the 18th century. She was written on Newton and his reputation on botany uh, and on electricity, all within that period. But her knowledge and her expertise and her communication stretches far beyond that. Uh, her book of a few years ago, Science of 4,000 Year History, uh, was very justifiably in receipt of a national prize. Uh, so we're very lucky to have her here today. And she's going to speak to us about science and women and World War One. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for inviting me and sort of sort of thank you for that very embarrassing <laughs> introduction. Uh, I hope I live up to the introduction. As Charlotte said, I'm basically an 18th century historian, but I'm going to start by showing you the book that got me interested in this topic. It's about this big, and it's a Newnham College in Cambridge. And you see it's covered in linen and it's got a hand-embroidered crest of the college on the front. And when you open up the book, it's a beautiful hand-bound book with very thick, creamy paper. And it's got very elaborate black and red lettering inside. And what it is, it's a list of all the women at Newnham who contributed to the war effort in the First World War. And they're sorted into categories of what they did. And of course, there's quite a few women who were basically making tea for the Red Cross. But there were enormous lists, particularly at the beginning, of women who'd won military decorations, both here and abroad, women who were scientists, and women who were doctors. And it was this book that made me determined to find out a bit more about what these women were doing, doing during the war. By the time the war started, there'd already been quite a few women who'd been educated in science at Cambridge. There were two women's colleges, so there were two women's laboratories like this. And I think my favorite scientist from Cambridge from this period was at Girton College, and it was this woman, Hertha Ayrton, and she came up with my favorite quote of all time, I don't agree with sex being brought into science at all. The idea of woman and science is completely irrelevant. Either a woman is a good scientist or she is not. And that's what she told a journalist in the early 20th century. You've probably never heard of her, but she was a close friend of Marie Curie. She was a physicist and an electrical engineer, and she worked on uh, street lighting. So it was a very important field that she was working in. She was also a suffragist. And this is one of the banners or, and posters that stem from one of the suffrage marches of this period just before the First World War. And you can see there's a university graduate like Hertha Ayrton, and she's desperately trying to get out of this locked space with convicts and lunatics because women had no vote for, the par for Parliament. And by the end of the war, attitudes towards women had changed quite substantially, and at the end of the war, women over 30 were given the vote. There was quite a feeling of triumphalism about this. So Millicent Fawcett, who was one of the great suffrage leaders, said, the war revolutionized the industrial position of women. It found them serfs and let them free. That's an attitude that many historians have continued to perpetuate. It said the industrial position relates to the amount of work, particularly in factories, that women were undertaking during the war. They left them free, or not serfs, because they had the vote. I think that's an enormously over-optimistic assessment. And when you examine the situation more closely, it seems quite apparent to me that the, view, that the position of women was not revolutionized in this, in this way during the war. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, during the next hour or so. So I'm going to divide the talk into five sections. The first one was marching for science. I'm going to talk about some of the links between science and the suffrage movement. The next three sections, I'm going to give specific examples of different people who were working, different women who were working scientifically during the war. And then I'm, at the end, I'm going to talk about post-war realities and illustrate how there was not such a dramatic change in the position of women as had originally been hoped. So the first section, marching for science, there's two main aspects of the suffrage movement. 
On the left, you can see these women who are marching, they're holding up banners, they're campaigning for the vote. And on the right is perhaps what's now a more familiar um, connection, association with the suffrage movement, is a suffragette who's uh, being taken away by the police, she's perhaps chained herself to the railings, and she's been very violent. A lot of women, as well as men, strongly disapproved of the violent suffragette, so the movement was quite split. And because women like that quite often were wearing uh, un uh, what were deemed to be unfeminine clothes, they had cropped hair, they were deeming and they were behaving in ways that were seen as unsuitable for women. There was a huge amount of antagonism towards the suffrage movement. And as this is the H.G. Wells lecture, I'm going to introduce some quotations from H.G. Wells. And you may know he wrote a book called Anne Veronica. I don't think it's a particularly good book, but it's very interesting because it's about the struggles of a young woman just before the war who wants to be uh, trained to be a biologist. And she has this very, very oppressive father who really can't understand what she's doing. She's got this nice home, what on earth is she doing going to a laboratory? And so Wells put in his mouth, the father's mouth, the sort of feelings that were uh, being held throughout the country. I think this expression is representative of what a lot of parents felt. She's disconnected, Veronica, and Veronica is disconnected with her beautiful, safe and sheltering home, going about with hapless friends to socialist meetings, displaying a disposition to carry her scientific ambitions to unwomanly lengths. So there's a disapproval and there's also the link between inappropriate behaviour, hapless friends, socialist meetings, and scientific ambitions. And this was a view, as I said, that was also held by real life fathers. So one of them said, uh, whose daughter was at Newnham, said, there is a regular manufacturing of very advanced women going on at Cambridge. So I'm going to talk about some more specific ways in which science and the suffrage movement were linked together. So firstly, suffragists, the new women, the modern, modern women of the 20th century, explicitly associated themselves with new scientific inventions. So you can see here this uh, air balloon, very, very recent invention, and there's a woman, she was an Australian actress, but this is in England, She's in the basket of the air balloon and she's throwing down lots of uh, leaflets uh, campaigning for the vote. And this is one of the beautifully embroidered silk banners that was carried it, uh, in some of the suffrage marches. And there were banners not only of Marie Curie, but of other women uh, who've been famous in science, such as Caroline Herschel and uh, Mary Somerville and Florence Nightingale. Well, a lot of scientific innovations were very rapidly taken up by women, and they were quite uh, central to the suffrage movement. But it's, it's not a straightforward movement. There's a, uh, there, there's a two-way interaction. So if you think particularly about this example of bicycles, when they were introduced in the early 19th century, they were impossible to ride if you were wearing a long flowing skirt, uh, and, they were, um, they were, and they were inherently very unstable. In response to demand, partly from women, in response to demand, the manufacturers of bicycles introduced all sorts of new features, such as brakes and gears and airfield air tyres, which made them easier to use. And in response, women who were deemed themselves to be modern and supported the suffrage movement associated themselves with new technology, so the bikes became quite emblematic of modern women. Manufacturers are obviously very quick to catch on to this association of science and modern women. So there were things like radium face cream, which might have been modern but probably wasn't a terribly good idea. And there was also inventions supposed to make women's life at home easier. So for example, things like vacuum cleaners and ovens uh, um, and wind-up phonographs and processed food. One of the disadvantages of all these new inventions was that particularly as people who had been servants went and worked in factories, middle class women had to do more and more domestic work. And in order to justify the vast amounts of money that their husbands had spent on all these inventions, they found themselves tied to the home to a greater extent than they had been before. They had to undertake more domestic work than had been, um, they had had to in the past. 
And the same is true in offices. There's a certain amount of de-skilling. So a machine like the typewriter was one that women could use, and it enabled women to compete with men and take over a lot of clerical jobs. And the, because the women were so eager to get the work, they were willing to accept jobs at lower salaries than the men. And that meant that immediately clerical jobs like typing became very low status work that was associated with women. And the quotation on the right is by Ray Strachey, who is one of the leading suffrage leaders. So as one process after another came to be regarded as women's work, it became simultaneously unskilled. And the assumption that women must inevitably be routine workers deserving of only a woman's wage remained unshaken. So as well as these technological links, there are also scientific arguments to back up and to justify the inferiority of women. And in that respect, I think Charles Darwin has got a lot to answer for. So in The Origin of Species, he, taught, he wrote about peacocks. I mean, this is a very well-known example that peacocks develop their splendid tails uh, to attract the drab peahens. In this book, The Origin of Species, he didn't write anything about human beings, but by 1871, when he wrote The Descent of Man, he argued that equality was scientifically impossible because during the long process of uh, natural selection, uh, men have uh, been selected to go hunting and to be clever, whereas women have been selected to stay at home. So the chief distinction in the intellectual powers of the two sexes is shown by man's attaining to a higher eminence in whatever he takes up than can woman, whether requiring deep thought, reason, or imagination, or merely the use of the senses or the hands. So this supposed scientific um, justification of the inferiority of women was something that became very widespread and greatly affected general attitudes towards women and whether they should work or not. H.G. Uh, Wells had clearly been reading his Darwin. So the contemporary woman of fashion is an unwholesome stimulant Stimulant. She achieves by artifice a sexual selection profounder than that of any other vertebrated animal. She outshines the peacock's excess. <coughs> and this is uh, in uh, Modern Utopia, which he wrote in 1905. And this was a book that was clearly very influential because it was quoted in the House of Commons by an opponent of women's suffrage. And the part of it that was quoted was this one, which, just, which talks about increasing differentiation as, in his terminology, races become more civilised. So what he says, an adult white woman differs far more from a white man than a negress or pygmy woman from her equivalent male. The education, the mental disposition of a white or Asiatic woman reeks of sex. Her modesty, her decorum is not to ignore sex, but to refine and put a point to it. Her costume is clamorous with the distinctive elements of her form. And that's just part of a much longer quotation <coughs> that was put forward in the House of, uh, House of Commons uh, to oppose the possibility <coughs> of women getting the vote. Unsurprisingly, there were a lot of clever women around who could use Darwinian arguments to support their own cause. So they fought back. So women on the left, Cicely Hampton, she was a great feminist <coughs> campaigner, um, she used the Darwinian argument to show how women have been, uh, in a way, deliberately downplayed. Women have been trained to be unintelligent breeding machines until they have become unintelligent breeding machines. And what she urged women to do is uh, not to pretend, not to emphasize <coughs> their capacities as unintelligent breeding machines, but, but to start behaving differently and promote themselves as women who were intelligent. There was another approach, uh, as epitomized by the, by the quotation on the right, which, to say, which was to argue that evolution is still happening in the human race, and in the future the, more, the modern woman will evolve to a higher level from women as they were at the time. So this is an example of that sort of argument. The woman of political and social activity will be different from the domestic woman, just as Paleolithic man differs from his Neolithic brother. 
And this is my favourite bit of um, suffragist anti-Darwinian propaganda, or Darwinian propaganda. So this is um, a drawing of the anti-suffragist, or the, I don't know how you pronounce it, prejudicidon. Um, it's um, an, an imaginary prehistoric creature which has a very, very tiny brain and its sight is so defective that it can't see past the end of its nose. And this was part of a whole article in a women's magazine arguing um, against the men who are too narrow-minded to see why women should get the vote. <coughs> the women were also, of course, fighting against centuries of prejudice against women. So, for example, they were, women have long been said to be determined by their physiology. It's an 18th century anatomical doll on the left, and their erratic behavior had previously been associated uh, with the womb. That's where the word hysteria comes from. But during the 19th century, uh, medical attention shifted to the ovaries. and uh, These were held to be responsible for women's feminine characteristics, so women's behavior were held to be uh, controlled physiologically. And this man, Sir Almuth Wright, was a very, very distinguished physician, and he often articulated that view, and this is just one quotation from the Times, where he associate, he in a way says the suffragist isn't responsible for her behavior because it's, uh, her behavior is controlled by her physiology. When the doctor lets his eyes rest on the militant suffragist, he cannot conceal from himself the physiological emergencies which lie behind her mental disorder. These are the sexually embittered women in whom everything is turned into gall and bitterness of heart and hatred of men. And he had a very straightforward solution to the problem of women suffragists. What you should do is, especially if they were militant, you should ship them off to the colonies because there were plenty of spare men out there for them to be married and then all their problems could be sorted out. There was also an association with eugenics, the idea of producing uh, children for the nation. And this example was uh, by Darwin's co cousin, Francis Galton, where he explicitly compared women uh, with horses. He wrote to the principal of Newnham College and said it was absolutely ridiculous uh, that graduate sh uh, graduates from Cambridge should go on and work. Instead, they should marry early and have large families with a good hereditary pedigree. And as he put it, it's a monstrous shame to use any of these gifted girls for hack work, such as breadwinning. It's as bad as using up the winners of the oaks in harness work. And this was, seems to be a view that was also espoused by H.G. Wells. He campaigned for a society of what he called virtual equality. And the idea is that women would be rewarded, women should be paid, uh, given salaries so that they could be independent. Uh, and they were, they were to be paid not for their professional careers, but for, for fulfilling their major responsibility, which was to rear large numbers of healthy, intelligent children to improve the whole in British nation. And this is what he wrote. In Utopia, a career of wholesome motherhood would be the normal and remunerative calling for a woman, and a capable woman who's born, bred, and begun the education of eight or nine well built <coughs> intelligent, and successful sons and daughters would be an extremely prosperous woman. So I just tried to sort of review some of the relationships between science and suffragism and some of the attitudes that there were. And I'm now going to talk more specifically about what women were doing. So the, the, in 1914, when the World War first started, within a few days, the reputation of the suffragists changed almost overnight because uh, the Union of Women's Suffrage decided to stop campaigning for the vote and instead turn their um, efforts to supporting the country during the war. And they set up a Women's Service Bureau and they employed a large staff of interviewers to place women into paid work as munitions workers, plumbers, fitters and clerks. And they also set up a lot of training schools. So this is a procession that went to the House of Commons in um, <coughs> 30,000 people, um, 30,000 women, campaigned in this right to serve procession, which ended at the House of Commons. And in 1916, the support of women, their contribution toward, towards the war effort, was recognized by the Minister of Munitions. 
who said in Parliament, it's not too much to say our armies have been saved, victory assured, by the women in the munition factories where they helped to produce aeroplanes, howitzer bombs, shrapnel bullets, shells, machine tools, mines, and have taken part in shipbuilding. And many, many thousands of women took over men's jobs. Um, while the men went off to the war, the women took over all their jobs. And I'm just going to show you a few, a few science and engineering pictures. So they were very involved in transport, um, in vehicle maintenance, of trains and cars and buses. You can see here a woman working uh, in an, as an engineer in a factory. And this young woman is working in uh, a, um, a hospital supply, supply group, sorry, something's gone wrong with my pages, a hospital supply department um, making prosthetic limbs. But by far the largest number of women were making music, uh, were in the munitions factories making shells and guns and explosives, and that was because all, previously all the relevant uh, materials had come in from Germany, and as soon as the war started, they couldn't be imported. So these pictures that I've just shown you very quickly all support the view that women were liberated by the war, but it's not as straightforward as that. Particularly at the beginning of the war, everybody thought that women should uh, stay at home. So there was some very patronising treatment. This is uh, a, a letter from a student at Newcastle, who was very uh, at U Newcastle University, and she was very caught up by the appeal for women munitions makers. And she spent 24 hours distracted, heart searching. They got permission from their parents. They were feeling heroic, and um, and then, so having made up their minds to volunteer, we were informed that our highest patriotic duty was to complete our education. The women who did, were able to work later on in the war, uh, people were more enthusiastic about women working, they were often given extremely, extremely repetitive work. So this picture is um, a large factory in Gretna where there was a 10 mile long complex for synthesizing cord cordite. And the women were given very, very repetitive work. The basic idea was that it was like, like following a cooking recipe. You were, you were given a chemical task and you just followed the instructions and went through, through with it. And 88% of the workers at Gretna were women. It was also incredibly dangerous work. Um, these women, um, you can see they're wearing protective clothing, but are working in munitions and bombs, there's explosives, it's obviously very dangerous from that point of view. But also they were working with very dangerous chemicals, so a lot of them, uh, their hair went green, their skin went yellow, which is why they were called canaries, and many of them became permanently ill or died. They were also paid at a much lower rate than the men. They were paid roughly two-thirds of what a man was paid. So you can see the woman doing the same work as this older man who hasn't gone off to the front, but she would be paid much less than him. So that was um, a review of, sort of some of the ways why working during the war wasn't fantastically liberating. Uh, for women who'd been uh, asked to work in this sort of factory sort of work. But what I was really, really more interested in is women who worked in <coughs> academic science and medicine. So most of you know Mary Stopes as the founder of Family Planning, but she was also a lecturer in paleobotany. And she articulated that very well this problem that was still felt by Rosalind Franklin, for example, many years later, is the lack of opportunities for informal discussions between male and female scientists. And that's why I called this section Insiders and Outsiders. As she put it, women high up in scientific positions, women with international reputations, are shut out from the concourse of their intellectual fellows. Well, I spoke, mentioned earlier uh, the scientist at Girton, Hertha Ayrton, and I'm going to present two views of her. One as an insider, and then I'm going to talk about her as an outsider. So in 1881, she, uh, she lost a uh, certificate in maths from Cambridge. She became the first female member of the Institute of Electrical Engineers. She read a paper on electrical street lights at the Royal Society, which was very well received, in fact so well received, that she won the Hughes Medal for Engineering and Technology at the Royal Society. So in many ways, she's an insider who's fully recognized. On the other hand, 
She couldn't get a degree in maths at Cambridge. No women were allowed to graduate formally at Cambridge until, surprisingly, late 1948. She was rejected from fellowship of the Royal Society on the grounds that she was married. And uh, when she invented uh, a flapper fan to, to sort of um, get, get rid of all the poisonous gas for soldiers who were in the trenches, she found it very difficult to get her voice heard because by then her husband had died and she no longer had access to any influential circles. So this sort of being an outsider was a huge problem for women. There were also very, very few women scientists. This is um, the 1903 English Woman's Yearbook and Directory, and this is a very, very small entry on science. And Madame Curie is right down here at the bottom. And almost all the scientific <coughs> societies, like chemistry society and things like that, they, they also excluded women. And these women that I'm going to talk about have continued to be excluded. They're, they're virtually never written about in uh, books by women talking about, uh, books by feminist historians mainly talking about women who worked during the war, because there were very few of them. Most of the books about women in the war, about the women I just showed you who worked in the munitions factories and in transport or in factories or offices and things like that. So the academic women are excluded by feminist historians. They're also excluded from regular <coughs> books about scientists because, there, again, there were very few of them, and it takes a certain amount of effort and determination to find out about them. And although there's quite a few books about uh, scientists and doctors during the war, almost all of them make no or virtually no mention of women. So I'm just going to discuss a few, um, a few examples to illustrate how, what sort of work women were doing during the war. So I'm going to start with museum curators. As soon as the war was declared, a, uh, a lot of men volunteered to go into the army, and later on they were forced to go into the army. So as the male staff left the museums, women were left um, basically uh, run it, running, uh, running the institutions, and they were given more and more responsibilities. So this, I chose this as a small, as a small antelope because it was named after the woman who discovered it, who was called Dorothea Bate. And this is a cave in Mallorca. That's her first graph of a cave where she discovered the antelope. And on the right, you can see her digging in Babylon with those absolutely marvelous clothes, just exactly the sort of thing you need for an archaeological site in the Middle East. At the Natural Science Museum, she took on more and more and more responsibilities as the man left. But she was ineligible for an official staff position. So this is a sort of ludicrous situation that she was in. For 37 years, she was classed as a temporary worker. And that meant that she was paid piecework for the work that she did. And there were men who were way inferior to her in terms of abilities, but they were permanently employed. And so they earned far more than she did. And this went on for 37 years. So even after the war, 1928, Women were at last allowed to apply for permanent jobs at the Natural History Museum, but uh, the, the jobs that they, they got were far lower, uh, the salaries were far lower than those who were paid to, them, to the men. So this is an example of how women's lives were not dramatically changed by the war. In terms of uh, women doing university research, there were again a lot of chemists, but doing far more high power work than at Gretna. And a lot of the major universities like Birmingham, Manchester, Bristol, they immediately devoted all their research uh, into, into wartime, um, things that were of wartime relevance. Meant that there were more and more opportunities for female scientists to take over the positions which previously had been occupied by men. And there's this, just one example, there's this woman, a uh, letter from a woman, Margaret Turner, at the University College of Wales offering her help. She's, uh, she said, I was one of the workers in the preparation of drugs. She'd be glad to hear of any further help I could give. I can put all my time and energy at your service for the next six weeks. This is volunteering. Anxious to know whether the few helpers down here could not be allowed to contribute further 
for the needs of the country. I, for one, am willing to eager and eager to give up all ideas of holiday while there remains so much to be done. So that's one piece of one letter that survives, but there must have been women in universities all across the country who are working extremely hard to support the war effort. The main university which was devoted to research work during the war was Imperial College in Women in, in London. And that was sort of more or less taken over by the Admiralty and the Air Force. And again, a lot of the male scientists left. So women had far superior positions to before. So in the Royal Flying Corps Drawing Office, there were 30 women. The Fly Room, uh, which was for testing and developing insecticides, was supervised by two women. Women, for the first time, were allowed to lecture. There had been women there doing research before, uh, but for, for the first time temporarily during the war not afterwards, temporarily during the war, they were allowed to lecture. And then there was an experimental trench which was done, dug out in the garden in Imperial College, and there was a team of eight women who were testing explosives in the trench. It's very difficult to find out much detail about these women. One reason was because they were engaged in work of national security. So there's this woman, Frances Micklethwaite. I found a, quite a long obituary of her in one of the chemical academic chemical journals, but this is all that it said about her war work. During the First World War, Miss Micklethwaite carried out work of national importance and was awarded the MBE for these services in 1919. So to be awarded the MBE, she was obviously doing something very significant, but it's virtually impossible to find out exactly what it was. Frances Micklethwaite, I learnt from the obituary, was basically a sort of backroom bottle cleaner before the war started. So the war did give her, unusually, gave her an opportunity to pursue a scientific career. There were other women, such as Martha Whiteley, who were practising research scientists before the war she'd been at, um, and she was temporarily diverted into war work, and she went to Imperial College. And she was the lead woman who was testing the explosives in the trench. And she had an explosive named after her. It was called DW, for Dr. Whiteley. And she was very involved in feminist politics. You can see the certificate in 1920. She was one of the first women to be allowed to join the Royal Society. They, unlike the Royal Society, they deigned to change their statutes so that they could admit women. And she constantly campaigned for women's rights. And she could, after the war, she went back into the previous research she'd been doing. Um, and she, she campaigned for women's rights, and she often lectured to younger women. And this is a lecture she gave, from a lecture she gave in the 1950s. She had, been, she had received the first sample of mustard gas that arrived in Britain, and it was Martha Whiteley and her team who tested it. And she said to these women, I naturally tested this a property by applying a tiny smear to my arm, and for nearly three months suffered great discomfort from the widespread open wound it caused in the bend of the elbow, and of which I still carry the scar, which I assume she showed them. So she was just one, this is um, a sort of more visible example of the sort of work that these women were doing. And they received very little recognition. There's a rare acknowledgement by a male scientist of how valuable they were. And he wrote in to the War Committee from Scotland, the workers who remained with me, he meant the women, gave up many opportunities for professional advancement. I mention these facts as an index of public spirit with which these women gave their services, services which have not received any public recognition. And so I just drew up this <coughs> picture of these anonymous silhouettes just to emphasize how in many periods, when you look back in the past, how difficult it is to find evidence of what women were doing. Uh, but there must have been thousands and thousands of women who were doing things like this. And there is, some, there is evidence about <coughs> it in the archives, but it is difficult to find. And it also means you have to be highly motivated to look for it. So I'm going to talk now about action overseas. And the general view, particularly at the beginning of the war, was that it was women's responsibilities to keep the home fires burning, look after the children and factories, while the men went off to war. And I'm going to talk about two particular areas in which women, could, did, women did work overseas. On the left, there's an operating theatre. And there were a few women who went out as 
um, as doctors to work in the hospitals. And of course, there were a lot of nurses who worked out. The other, um, the other main area was the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps and the, and the other, um, the other um, auxiliary parts of the army. And you can see from the advert that their major role was seen as taking over the women's work of the men. So they were at, the army was advertising for cooks, clerks, um, and, and waitresses, and domestic workers, because previously it was men who'd been doing all that work at the front. And the idea was to send women out to replace the men doing that sort of domestic work, so then more men could be released to fight on the front. And by the end of the war, about 60,000 women had served in the armed forces, mostly in the WAAC. And rather surprisingly, it was a woman who led, a woman scientist, who led that organization in France. And this is her picture, sort of a rather unlikely looking candidate for, to work as the head of an army. Uh, she, um, but she, you can see, she came from a very sort of aristocratic, upper class, wealthy family. And by 1909, she was the head of the Department of Botany at Birkbeck College. And there's, on the left, there's a modern edition of a key book she wrote on fungi, which was her area of research. And she wrote, perhaps the only sphere in which at that time young men and worked, women worked freely together, the laboratories of a modern university. And she used that as a sort of justification, as an explanation of why it was, to her surprise, she was invited to head the new women's army in France. So for the last few years of the war, she abandoned her position at Birkbeck, uh, and she became the first controller of the WAAC, the first woman to win a military CBE, and then she went on for the year after the war to be the commandant of the Women's Royal Air Force. And then she went back, after that, she left the Army and the Air Force and went back to fungi genetics at Birkbeck, where she was a professor. So for her, the, being in the Army was an interlude in a very distinguished scientific career. And you can see her here in her Army uniform. She said, I crossed the channel into a new and different world. And if you read her autobiography, she seems to have spent most of her time arguing um, with, uh, with the men who were out there about uniforms. Uniforms were a major item of controversy because they were traditionally an emblem of masculinity. And there were long debates about the skirt lengths, whether you should have pockets on the breasts, whether you should have pockets on your hips. And from the women's point of view, the, women, the army, the uniform was an emblem of their patriotism, their efficiency, their dedication to duty. But she had to overcome um, repeated opposition. I'm just going to show you two cartoons to show the constant jibes that were made at women in uniform. So this is our Amazon core standing easy, and you can see they're, they're all putting their makeup on. And if you read novels of the, uh, or stories of the time, they're always sort of couched in a, a woman's sort of curls attractively, peeping out from underneath the strap of her hat. There's hu always huge emphasis on these clothes, which were seen as being totally inappropriate for women. And then there was the joke that she particularly loathed that it's better to have a whack on the knee than a slap on the back. And that was a constant joke that she had to fight against. Her career path was temporarily diverted by the war, rather than being permanently altered by it. And the same was true for the thousands and thousands of young women who volunteered as nurses, the most um, famous of which is Vera Britton. And she, like a lot of other young women, was very, very enthusiastic about going off to the war because after 20 years of sheltered gentility, I was at last seeing life. And she, her autobiography is fascinating. It presents quite a romanticized view. And, but after the war, she was no longer a nurse. But for the doctors who went out, the situation was very different. And there were doctors who went out. It was very difficult for women before the war to train as doctors. There were very few hospitals that would take them. The London School of Medicine for Women was one of the very, very few places that they could train. But as the male doctors went off to the front, more and more medical schools opened their doors to women because there was a great shortage of doctors. 
And the most prominent medical campaigner was this woman on the left, Elsie Inglis, Inglis who was Scottish, a very, uh, very prominent suffragist in Scotland. And she took advantage of the suffragist network to uh, recruit volunteers and to raise funds. And within only two weeks after the outbreak of the war, she offered the war office a fully equipped and staffed hospital and offered to go out to the front. But the war office told her to go home and keep still. The commanding officers do not want to be troubled with hysterical women. So, very angry, she contacted some of her allies like Belgium, Russia, France, and they were absolutely delighted at having the prospect of all these highly trained doctors and nurses and research laboratories and everything else going out there all paid for. So the first unit went off to Serbia in December 1914, and the women remained in Salonika through, um, at the hospital throughout the war, staying there in absolutely appalling conditions. But they did have well-kitted hospitals, well-kitted laboratories, they did a lot of research into malaria and dysentery, as well, of course, as looking after a lot of people who were wounded, a lot of people who were ill. And they stayed there until March of 1920, when the units uh, were disbanded. And they also collaborated with the French in launching a lot of public health campaigns. There was a big difference between, um, sorry, so this, this is the autobiography of Isabel, um, Isabel Hutton. Uh, she was an Edinburgh doctor. She formerly worked with children and in a mental hospital. She went out to Serbia and Salonika. And her biography is an extraordinary account of the difficulties and the privations that these women had to endure. One of the things she commented, that there was a big difference between what women like her could do. She was independent, she was funded by other women. She was in a far better position than the very small number of women who were hired by the army. And she, she wrote about the woman who was 50, much older than her, a doctor, what a rotten position these women have. She's got no rank, she's junior to the most junior male doctors. So the few women who were doctors who were employed by the army had a very limited um, opportunities for what they could do, whereas these independent, self-funded women uh, were doing every single conceivable piece of surgical work. So this is a cemetery showing how many people died, and this is a, a, um, Isabel Hutton's description of what happened when she arrived in Vranja. And she discovered that the operating room was a ghastly sight, the floor was swimming in blood, pails crammed with, um, black with flies around an old deal table. So these women were forced to be very independent, to show plenty of initiative, and also obviously to be excellent surgeons. Despite all that, there was still discrimination against them by the War Office. So, the woman, so Elizabeth Stoney was appointed the head radiologist in Salonika, but the War Office re withdrew permission for any woman to hold the post. And as Isabel Hutton wrote, they might have changed their mind if they had seen her carrying heavy loads of equipment, repairing electric wires, sitting astride bridge tape tents in a howling gale, and working tirelessly on an almost starvation diet. So this is something that I, I read a book uh, a few, few weeks ago about called something like medicine in World War I. Not one of these women were mentioned, and they were playing absolutely crucial roles um, out, but not on the Eastern Front. So I'm going to finish by talking about post-war realities and to emphasize what I said at the beginning, that the war was not necessarily such a completely liberating experience for women. Uh, this is in 1918 after peace was declared, that there's, a, there's a big ceremony at Buckingham Palace, and you can see all the voluntary nurses and women like Vera Britton, uh, in, they're, they're the ones who show up in white. So this was a great celebration of the contribution that women had made during the war. But only about a year later, attitudes of it uh, changed quite dramatically. One problem is that there was quite a lot of unemployment during the war. And there was huge resentment against women, particularly against married women, who were accused of taking away the jobs that should rightly go to men. And very rapidly, women were expected to conform to the old stereotypes. So you can see, during the war, um, although all these government recruiting posters, 
to get women to serve. After the war, the press were coming out with comments like, a large part of the female population of the country have had the time of their lives swaggering about in every kind of uniform. I mentioned that huge resentment. They must return to being wives and mothers. Now the men are coming home. And then I showed you pictures of um, all the women who were working at Sheffield. A whole group of women were trained um, in steel production. But as the company said, on the signing of the armistice, most of the women were replaced by returning soldiers. So there was a complete reversion to the previous stereotypes that women should not be active in a uniform. They should stay at home, support them, and look after the family while the men went out to earn the wages. And this is an attitude that continued between the war. There was far more scientific activity, far more government investment in science than there had ever been before. But this is a comment by Kathleen Cullum, an industrial chemist. So the male graduate is paid a reasonable salary. However young, if his university qualifications are good, he's usually given quite a dignified position from the beginning. The girl who works side by side with him at the university is hard up and constantly humiliated. She'll be happier if she is not too enterprising because then her sense of frustration will be less. I think that's actually a chilling comment. The same was true of doctors. I, this is the autobiography of Isabel Hutton, and I explained how she was a very skilled surgeon, very used to working under appalling conditions. And she loved surgery, but she said, I knew that it would have been unwise and unprofitable to make surgery my life's work at home. And that's because surgery was a very male-dominated speciality in medicine. She went on being a doctor, but she didn't do surgery. The medical schools immediately closed their doors to women. They went back to being all male medical schools. And in the army, women doctors were unable to have any commission until World War II. And as <coughs> Cicely um, Hamilton, I quoted her earlier, this is what she wrote in 1935. The battle we thought won is going badly against us. We are retreating where once we advanced. In the eyes of certain modern statesmen, women are not personalities. They are reproductive faculty personified, which means that they are back at secondary existence, counting only as normal as wives and mothers of sons. So that was in 1935. We're uh, 80 or so years later now. There's still a lot of debates about the best way to educate women. These are two versions of educating women at Cambridge. You can see on the left, Newnham College, which is still women's own, women only. So they, they espouse the idea that separate spheres is better for women. On the other hand, at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, you can see that there's a woman who is teaching, and there's a very mixed class. There's also the phenomenon which you're probably familiar with, the leaky pipeline. Um, I don't expect you to be able to read these figures, um, but you can, you can see that um, at the top is the, um, is the, level, um, the, num the percentage of female researchers, and by the time you get down to here, these are the professors, there are far, far fewer proportionally. At the higher up the, your, the career ladder you go, the fewer the proportion of women and the higher the proportion of men. So 100 years ago, this is what Hertha Eton said, as I told you before, I don't agree with sex being brought into science at all. The <coughs> idea of women in science is completely irrelevant. Either a woman is a good scientist or not. So these are the words of a woman who lived right through World War I. I'm not sure if they are true, much truer now than they were then. They're certainly not completely true. So a hundred years have gone by since she was refused membership of the Royal Society on the grounds that she was married. And of course, under modern gender legislation, that overt discrimination would be absolutely impossible. But although equality of opportunity is firmly entrenched, the problem of unequal numbers remains unresolved, especially at higher levels. But I suppose there's one thing that I am glad about, that uh, we have not implemented the society that H.G. Wells recommended in his, in his book about utopia. We do not have virtual equality. We are not paid more for the, for the number of children that we produce. But there still are great problems uh, for women in science.
Dat is geen trots.